بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قبض من التقين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين أما بعد ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الوقت ذا من لساني ويقوى قولي Respected brothers and elders, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, last week we spoke briefly about proof of prophethood. I mentioned some of the. There were two key areas to. When we want to see if someone is a true prophet, right? There's two key things to look at. Number one is the personality of the person. What kind of person is this? And we looked at the seer of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many events. In the seer of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which show his honesty, his integrity, um, even before he was the Prophet of God. And number two, the message that this this Prophet brings. And we looked at the Quran and its unique style in comparison to the Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Continuing with this, today I would like to look at. The prophet, prophecies of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Every prophet makes some prophecies. That's where it comes, the name comes from. And some of the greatest evidences and proofs of the prophethood of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are the are the multiple occasions where he made clear, direct, you know, explicit prophecies. And predictions of future events. Now, these predictions, with the confidence of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said said them with, he could have only done so if he had some divine revelation or knowledge that was given to him from Allah subhanahu wa taala. The, the in the Quran, Allah says, "Qul la aqulu lakum indi khazainullah." Tell him, O Prophet. I'm not saying I have the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَا أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ And I don't know the unseen وَلَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ إِنِّي مَلَكَ I'm not saying to you that I am an angel of God إِنْ أَتَّبِعُوا إِلَّا مَا يُوحَى إِلَيَّ I'm only following what's been revealed to me So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that there are things revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's not given to anyone else now we have you know psychics so called psychics uh, astrologers fortune tellers who make predictions who convince people that they know what's going on going on in their life but the way they speak in it's very v- first of all it's vague it's unclear sometimes there are things which have some element of truth but they're mixed with a thousand lies if you go on google and you search a fortune telling course within about 15 16 hours you will be able to convince the average person that you know their future right there's a way of questioning there's a way of finding out stuff that you know and there's a way of making predictions you know if a few hours training and you can you know convince someone to make these kind of uh you know fake predictions about their future or be able to tell the past however there are things that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have informed him of right in the past in the 16th century there was a french astrologer and a physician by the name of Nostradamus and he's fam- Nostradamus is very famous for his uh, he had a w- uh, book called the prophecies right and these are poems in w- which he predicted different events over the uh, f- f- you know over the centuries right and these some of these events were political events these were letters that he wrote to the king uh, the king of France and however when you read these poems let me translate to english the very vague cryptic you know they're not in reference to any single individual right these are you know common th- things that occur over time in different places and many of his predictions are absolute and total failures 
1999, right, there was a, um, you know, uh, there's a big, there's a lot of noise that was being made about the world coming to an end, right, and it was based on Nostradamus' uh, predictions. The Guardian, they, in 1999, they published a, uh, a news article saying, the world's about to end, uh, ignore this article if it's already ended, don't worry about it, you know, Nostradamus made the predictions, right. But Nostradamus, is, his predictions, his prophecies, many of them are clear failures and some of them people have no idea what it even means or what, it, what it's referring to. However, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke clearly, he addressed individuals that this is going to happen to you or this is going to happen to such an such a individual. He addressed groups, nations and the people closest to him, right? So he's not making vague kind of predictions, he's making clear cut, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's te- informing them what's going to happen, right? And oftentimes he's advising people when you are in this situation, when you find yourself in this situation, to do sabr, to do this and to do that, right? So today inshallah, I'm only gonna mention a few, I'm sure you've heard of some of these predictions, but it's good to hear about them again. In the Quran, in Surah Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif la meem ghulibati rum fi adna al-ardi wa hum min ba'di ghulabihim sayaglibun fi bid'i sinina lillahi al-amru min qablu wa min ba'd wa yawma idhin yafrahu al-mu'minun. From me, you know, from the corner of the world, the Quran makes this prediction. The Quran informs about the relationship, the political tension between the Christian Byzantine Empire and the the Persian Sassanid Empire. The Quran says that the Byzantines have been defeated in the nearest land, but they after their defeat will overcome. Within three to nine years. Fi bid'i sini. Bid'i means it refers to an amount between three and nine. From the year 613 to 619, the Byzantines, they were in utter chaos and decline. It was just one loss after the other. And they lost territories in modern day Turkey, Antioch, in Damascus, in Armenia, in Jerusalem, and, you know, some of the the uh, parts of Africa and in Egypt but at this time the Quran makes a prediction that they've been defeated yet there's going to be they are going to overcome and soon be victorious and not in the future but very soon at this time it makes no sense for the Quran to have made this prediction right when people predict on a fight or a game, right, they see what's the past record, or what's how how this fight has been doing recently, and then they go and place their bet on them. When people make political observations and commentaries, about Imran Khan's going to do this and you know he's going to do this, they do it because of you know what's going on, what's the current latest, and then they just project project it to the future. But the Quran at this time it tells you know, there was no sign that the Byzantine would have made any kind of, uh, you know, not just a victory, but to come and totally defeat the Persians, it makes no sense. But the Quran tells them. And soon after, from the verge of extinction, the Christians, they make you know they are once more victorious against the Persians, and this is not this is something ju- not just found in uh, our you know books of Islamic history, right? This is something that even non-Muslims are picked up on. Edward Gibbon, who has a book called "The History of Decline and the Fall of Roman Empire," right? He says at the at this at the time when this he find he picks up on this 
this prediction from the Quran and it says at the time when this prediction is said to have been delivered no prophecy could be more distant from its accomplishment since the 12 years of Hercules announced the approaching dissolution of the empire right so he says that when this prediction was made that they soon will be after they lost they will be victorious there's no prediction that could be you know far more it would seem like it's far-fetched right but the Quran made this and even the non-muslims they when this ayah came they mocked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam someone by the name of Ubay ibn Khalaf right he said this is nonsense how can this even uh, take place but just from the verge of defeat the Byzantine you know they once again uh, they once again are victorious and they take back the lands that they had lost and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدُ وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ that the decision of the matter is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before and after right and on the day the believers will rejoice in the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right now what is this talking about the tafsir scholars they mentioned that you know there are different reasons that would have been uh, victorious number one is that their prophecy has come alive the prophet sallallahu alaihi the quran made this prophecy and it's come alive in you know not in not even you know in in the in this few centuries but in their lifetime right rather within the three to nine years that the quran mentioned and number two because the defeat of the persians and the victory of the 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 the, the byzantine empire this was a sign of an other and uh, the next uh, prophecy and that was the victory of Islam they were both linked together similarly we look in the Quran and one of the shortest surahs we find is the Quran you know dooming Abu Lahab to hell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says May the hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed. His wealth and whatever he's earned is not going to benefit him. When this was made, when this ayah came down, Abu Lahab was one of the, the most staunch enemies of Islam. And he lived for about nine years after this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that he's, he's going to be destroyed. That's going to help him. You know, Hamadatul Hatab. If Abu Lahab wanted to prove that the, the Quran is incorrect and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is incorrect, all he had to do was declare that no, actually, I'm a Muslim. Why would Allah subhanahu wa taala punish me if I'm a believer? He didn't have to really believe, but just to prove the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa taala is going to help Jahannam. Just to prove the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wrong, all he had to do was just say, "Khalas, I, you know, now I'm a, I'm a believer." But no, Abu Lahab did not even do this. He knew about this, but he did not do this. Let's move on to another prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Auf bin Malik, he says that in the in the Battle of Tabuk. He went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, "Did sit and bayna yadi saab, count six things before the day of Qiyamah, and these six things are things that are taking place in a sequence. Number one, mauti, my death. Number two, thumma fathu baytil muqaddis. Count the conquer." The, the, the conquest of Jerusalem. ثم موتان يأخذ فيكم كقعاص الغنم. Two plagues that will take place, like, and they will you know kill you, like a plague that takes place in the sheep and it kills the sheep. 
ثم استفاضة المال حتى يعطي الرجل مئة دينار فيظل ساخطا then there's going to be a surplus flow of wealth where someone's going to be given a man's going to be given a hundred dinar and he's not going to be happy he's not happy with it a hundred dinar ثم فتنة لا يبقى بيت من العرب إلا دخلته a fitna that no house of the Arabs is going to remain except that this fitna is going to enter inside it and then ثم هدنة تكون بينكم وبين بني بني الأصفر then there's going to be a truce between you and the Banu Asfar, this referred to the, the Christians, the Byzantines, in which they will betray you and march against you under 80 flags, and under each flag will be 12,000 soldiers. So six things the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. Number one was the death of the Prophet ﷺ, right? Number two, Jerusalem, the conquest of Jerusalem. This was conquered five years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ in the year 15 Hijri. Then he mentioned the two plagues. This was the plague of Amwas that took place in the year 18 Hijri, in which, you know, the amount of death that took place, the amount, just the companions that became Shaheed, you know, you can't even count him, right? And then the surplus of wealth. We've seen this in our history multiple on multiple occasions. Right? One was the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, at the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, that there would first of all be they would be afraid they, they would go out looking for someone to give their sadaqah to and they wouldn't find this. Okay? They wouldn't have anyone there who would be who's willing to accept zakat who's zakat eligible. Right? But here the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that you will go and give someone a hundred dinar and he wouldn't be happy with this. Okay. Now what this means, the wealth will be so much that a hundred dinar, which is quite a significant amount, will seem like nothing. Okay. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned that there's going to be a a truce between Muslims and the Byzantines or the Christians. This is yet to occur, and the ulama mentioned that this will be a prophecy that will take place at the you know about the end of times. When we look at the uh, general hadith, we find uh, other mentions of a truce taking place between Muslims and Christians, and then some betrayal that will take place and then uh, fighting that will happen after that similarly the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned multitude of muslim conquests that will take place and he mentioned them naming cities and countries you know by the name he mentioned rome persia egypt yemen india constantinople Right, and the ulama they mentioned when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Rome, and when he mentions Constantinople, is referring to the same thing. Okay, because these were the centers of the Christian uh, uh, empires, and the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned them without any doubt or without any vagueness. Barab bin Azib radiyallahu anhu, he mentions that when the Muslims they were building the trench, the Khandaq, around Medina. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what happened was they found a large boulder that was an obstruction and it was getting in the way. And nobody could break this. Right? Nobody could you know shatter into smaller pieces and remove the obstruction. So they called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he took the axe and he began to hit it and with every hit he recited bismillah and he hit it and the boulder this you know this large stone it broke into pieces and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allahu akbar u'tiitu mafatiha al-sham 
He said, I have been given, Allahu Akbar, I've been given the keys of, of Syria. Wallahi inni la'ubsiru qusuraha al-humar. He says that, I swear by God, I see its red palaces from here. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hit the boulder again and he broke into more pieces. And said, Allahu Akbar, u'atitu mafatiha faris. I've been given the keys of Persia. I said, Wallahi inni la'ubsiru al-madain wa'ubsiru qasraha al-abiyad min makani hadha. I can see madain and I can see its white palaces from my place here. And then the Prophet Sallallahu hit this again. And he said, Allahu Akbar, u'titu mafatih al-Yaman. I've been given the keys of Yemen. Wallahi inni la'ubsiru abab al-san'a min makani hadha. I can see the doors of San'a from my place here. Now when this happened, the non-Muslims they began to mock the Prophet Sallallahu This happened quite early, you know. Before he gained any significant amount of territory in Arabia. It was just Medina and some of the surrounding areas of Medina. They still face danger from Mecca. This is exactly what, what uh, Khandaq was. This was when all of Arabia came against the Prophet ﷺ. It makes no sense for the Prophet ﷺ to have made this, you know, these massive claims. Okay, when Arabia itself was not under his control. He was just trying to protect Medina at this time. And when the Arabs heard this, the Muslims heard this, they began to laugh at the Prophet. He's dreaming about, you know, uh, about fighting the, the superpowers, the Persians and the Byzantines, right? And their intention was, we're going to finish him. And the Prophet is telling the believers, look, this Khandak, you're going to get over this, this campaign. You're going to survive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to help you. And you're going to have, you know, far greater victories and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he told the Muslims about Egypt and he told them that treat the people of Egypt with dignity respect and any if you make any treaties with them honor the treaties right and Egypt was conquered in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. And Yemen and Syria and Persia, Iran, all these were areas that, that, were, that were conquered in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. Right? Similarly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he did not just make these predictions of conquest or victory but rather he told them the when Sh- when Syria will be conquered Sham right the word uh, the, uh, Syria itself is not Sham is not just restricted to Syria okay it includes the entire Levant area that includes from Syria all the way to Jerusalem right so Sham was you know, historically much greater than just what we have Syria now. But he told them when Syria will be, uh, when Sham will be conquered, and when Persia will be conquered, then there will be no Caesar after this, and there will be no Kisra after this, the ruler of of uh, Persia. When per- when the Persians were defeated by the Muslims, that was the end of the empire. And in regard- regards to the Byzantines, well, Imam Shafi'i and scholars like Imam Khattabi, they explain that in the air, in the Sham area, this was the last conquest of, this was the last defeat of the, the Christians. When Muslims cre- defeated the Romans, after this, they were never able to take back uh, Syria. In the fifth century there were some attempts to regain some parts of of sham however uh, sham still remained under the abbasids officially and there were not any major lands that were taken uh, by them the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he also addressed his his family 
that there's going to be his Ahlul Bayt, that there's going to be trouble within them. And we saw the troubles that took place between the wives of the Prophet and Ali radiallahu anhu, especially Aisha radiallahu anha. But the Prophet he informed the Ummah that there's going to be infighting in the Ummah and that's something that the Ummah will not be able to do anything about. He said, سألت ربي ثلاثة خصال I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things فأعطاني اثنتين ومنعني واحدة He granted me two things and he said he did not grant my, my, uh, me one thing سألت ربي أن لا يهلكنا بما أهلك به الأمة قبلنا Oh Allah do not destroy us like you destroyed with the things that you destroyed those nations before us right? Do not destroy us in our entirety like you destroyed those before us فَعَطَانِيهَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me this. This, w- this is why we don't see, you know, uh, maskh and people being changed into monkeys and, and pigs like it took place before us. وَسَأَلْتُ رَبِّي أَنْ لَا يُظْهِرَ عَلَيْنَا عَضُوًا غَيْرَنَا فَعَطَانِيهَا I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to grant, to place an enemy, an outside enemy upon us who is going to wipe us all out. Right? An outside enemy who's going to wipe us all out. This is why even the the uh, Mongols they could not. At the time when the Mongols came, Muslims believed that these were the the, uh, the, the Yajuj Majuj, right? Because of how severe the test was. Many Muslims learned centers of learning were destroyed, wiped out. Libraries of books. In them, if you lost a book. You know, there are th- hundreds and thousands of scholarly works which have been lost in Islamic history because someone burnt the book and that was, there was the only uh, uh, copy of the book in the entire world at the time, right? The devastation that was caused by the Mongols was unbelievable. But despite this, the entire Ummah in its entirety was not uh, uh, wiped out. The last thing the Prophet said, سَأَلْتُ رَبِّي أَنْ لَا يَلْبِسَنَا شِيَعٍ فَمَنَعَنِيهَا I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to split my ummah into groups, into factions, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not grant me this wish. Regarding the events that took place with Ali radiallahu anhu, Aisha radiallahu anha, and Muawiyah radiallahu anha, and the, and the Khawarij at Nahrawan, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He Said about Hussein radiallahu anhu That Inna ibn hadha sayyidun That this son of mine is a leader And it's hoped that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will Join between the two, fa- two Factions These large groups of Muslims Due to him and this is what Hussein anhu, uh, Hassan anhu was able to do when he was able to have a treaty, peace treaty and hand over the power to Muawiyah anha. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri anhu, he says that once the Prophet wasallam said a dissenting faction will splinter at a time of disunity between the Muslims. He said at the time of disunity when there's going to be war between the Muslim civil war there's going to be another faction what's going to split up so they, now there are three factions and they will be fought by the one more correct of the two parties so there will be two parties fighting one of them will split up there's going to be a faction that's going to split from this party and the party the original two parties who were fighting the one that was more correct from these two parties will fight this this uh, uh, this this faction that split up we have to really understand what's this talking about at the time of ali radiallahu anhu when ali radiallahu anhu he fought jamal and he fought safin against muawiyah radiallahu anhu he went and he fought a third civil war and that was against the khawarij in nahrawan who were the khawarij the Khawarij are not Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. The Khawarij were those people, 
right? You know, in, in, in when we read the Sifat, so there are some characteristics. There are some beliefs that we define as the beliefs of Khawarij. But they are historical Khawarij. The first group to be described as the Khawarij, okay, were the historical Khawarij. And these were the people who broke from the group of Ali radiallahu anhu. They were not outsiders. Okay. And what were the roots of the Khawarij? Once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a man who, who was called Dhul Khuwaysira. And he accused the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of not doing justice. He said, you're not just. And the Sahaba, they did not like this. And you know, they wanted to you know, punish him. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, leave him. He said, he will certainly have fellows who will cause you to belittle your own prayer when compared to their prayer. And his fasting when compared to, you know, their fasting. So there will be a group from this person's, you know, followers, whose salah will be, you know, your salah compared to them will be nothing. Your fasting will be, compared to their fasting will be nothing. And they will recite the Quran, but it will not pass beyond their throats. It will not go down to the heart. And they will leave the religion as an arrow passes through the hunting animal, the hunted animal. And shoot an arrow at the animal, it passes through it. And when you look at this arrow, there's no sign of, so if you shoot an, an, uh, an animal, there's no sign of blood, feathers, you know, skin, it just passes straight through it. So the Prophet said, the Iman will be like this. The Quran will pass through them, but they will have no traces of Iman inside them, despite their, this incredible amount of ibadah and worship that they will have. And then the Prophet said, their sign will be a black man whose limbs will appear like a woman's breast or will be like a disfigured lump of flesh and he, they will emerge at a time when people are disunited. Right? The Prophet ﷺ even gave the exact sign of this historical khawarir. Abu Sa'id says, I testified that I heard this hadith directly from Rasulullah ﷺ. He said, and I testify when Ali radiallahu anhu fought against the Khawarij, he instructed him, go and find this individual. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, this, you're going to find this. And he said he fought and he brought this exact individual to Ali radiallahu anhu and he found that the signs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned were exactly as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had described upon him. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa knew that these events would take place but he did not and he informed them the question is why did the Prophet وسلم, not prevent them right why did he not prevent them Khair, let's move on that's for you to think about inshallah maybe we can speak about this uh, some other time inshallah the last thing I'm going to mention is signs of prosperity, wealth, and what we call hedonism that will spread amongst the poor. The Prophet said, Abu Hurairah anhu, he says, the Prophet said, La taqumu sa'atu hatta yakthur al malu. The day of Qiyamah will not take place until wealth increases and a person is going to come out with his wealth try to give his zakat and nobody's going to accept from him because people have too much they have enough wealth that they cannot accept zakat and then the Prophet said this is very important he said Qiyamah will not take place until the land of the Arabs will become, will revert back to meadows and rivers. The Arabs, lands of the Arabs, were the lands of the Arabs, the deserts. 
they will ref re revert back to meadows and rivers first of all the first part of the this hadith we live in times where we have 99 percent you know uh, more luxury than uh, we have more luxury than 99 percent of our history put together okay even those who are seen as poor we have more softer beds you know more luxury uh, uh, vehicles to travel you know to communicate than some of the wealthiest kings of the past the thing i want to look at here is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that he mentioned a transformation in the agriculture of Ar the arabian deserts and now just recently there have been efforts now in arabia to literally have you know farming and you know miles and miles of uh, green grass growing you know try to uh, create artificial lakes and now you have tr um, efforts to in in places like dubai where the temperature is 50 and 55 degrees to create artificial rain this was this is first of all you know in our recent history this is unprecedented but it was impossible for arabs to even ever imagine this taking place but the prophet sallallahu said that it will refer back to it will go back to rivers and and uh, meadows it's only recently that research tells us that the arabian deserts were once upon a time rivers and grasslands right there's an um, in a research in institute called max planck institute and this is they, re they released a report and said extensive excavation over the decade revealed stone tools from multiple periods of prehistoric settlement by early human groups the oldest 400,000 years ago analysis of samples from the ancient lakes and remains from hippos right why hippos because hippos need this is important because hippos need you know several meters of water right that's that's the kind of water that they live in they don't live in small you know uh, ponds that's not where they they, they uh, live in so from remains from hippos and other animals reveal that during several periods in the distant past the peninsula hosted year-round lakes and uh, uh, grasslands during these windows of hospitable climate early humans and animals they move from northeast africa into arabian peninsula right and flowing rivers and lakes surrounded by grasslands would have attracted animals and humans to migrate in pursuit of these uh, these rivers the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us that these uh, arabian lands will once again revert back to now this was not something that was known there was no imagination nobody could imagine that the dry barren lands which present danger you know or uh, nobody people will not travel through these lands these, these deserts by themselves right they will only travel in groups because there was so much danger uh, but the prophet sallallahu he made he, he made this prediction that they will go back to its original and recent times we find out that there are efforts now to try to create these uh, artificial lakes and rivers uh, in Arabian desert similarly we find many many a hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he mentioned uh, events that would take place the famous hadith people competing in buildings Right. Similarly, we find many weak narrations that people have understood to refer to, you know, tools, you know, that we have now, satellites, TVs, phones, you know, people communicating. Right. One thing is for sure that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he received the, this knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa taala. 
and it was only a, a true Prophet of God who could have received this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us belief in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.